Um, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to Alma's first uh, virtual book launch event. Um, my name is Ido Rosenzweig. I'm the chairman of Alma. Uh, Alma is an association for the promotion of international humanitarian law. It's an NGO, uh, non-profit NGO uh, for the promotion of the knowledge, understand understanding and discussion of international humanitarian law of IHL. Um, ALMA is a volunteer-based organization. Everyone that works with ALMA or uh, cooperates with ALMA does it completely on a volunteer base. And ALMA was established about a little over 10 years ago. And for the, the last 10 years, we've been working on, on several events, on several projects. Um, one of them is an ongoing IHL forum that we used to have uh, more physically uh, it is a jointly project with the Interdisciplinary Center in Ertelia. And now that um, circumstances have changed, we've decided to launch a new project, which is the virtual uh, book launch series. Um, and, and this is our, our first event. This is our first, um, our first book launch. And we are very happy and we are very proud of the guests we have and the speakers that we have. So I don't want to stall much of the time. So I'm going to move to, to the more uh, practical, substantial part of the event. But before I introduce the speaker, I would like, like to say thank you to Karina Greenberg, the coordinator of the forum. Um, who's been uh, helping us a lot and she's been the actual uh, live person behind the whole the, the organization and yeah I think that's about it um, so let me start by introducing the speakers and then we will have uh, uh, the short presentations the, the format is going to be uh, Laura is going to present her book, and then each of the commentators is going to uh, provide their input. And then after that, Laura will have her uh, uh, right to uh, answer some of the comments that will be brought by the, the commentators. Following that, we will have a short Q&A session um, in accordance with the time that uh, remains. Okay, so let's move to proper introduction. So the guest of honor, of course, is Dr. Laura Inigo Alvarez. Uh, Dr. Laura Inigo Alvarez is a researcher and a lecturer in public international law. She obtained her PhD in international law in 2019 under a joint doctorate program between the Utrecht University and the University of Sevilla. She holds an LLM cum laude from the University of Sevilla, and she further studied at uh, Leuven, at KU Leuven, and the Hague Academy of International Law. Previously, she was a junior researcher of the European Project Frame and coordinator of the European Master's Program in Human Rights and Democratization at the University of Sevilla. She is also a regular contributor to Oxford reports on international law in domestic courts, and her primary research interests are armed non armed non-state actors, international humanitarian law, international criminal law, and business and human rights. Um, I'm going to present the commentators as well, and then we will just move one by one. Uh, Emanuela Gilal is a senior researcher fellow at the Oxford Institute for Ethics, Law, and Armed Conflict, and an associate fellow at, in Chatham House International Law Program. Her research interests include international humanitarian law, with particular focus on the protection of civilians and mechanism for promoting compliance, the role of the Security Council in enhancing the protection of civilians, counterterrorism, sanctions, and principled humanitarian action. Uh, next is Ezekiel Repes. Uh, Ezekiel is a thematic legal advisor at Geneva Call, a humanitarian NGO that engages armed, armed groups to increase their respect to humanitarian norms with previous experience working for the ICRC in Colombia, Afghanistan, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. And last but definitely not least, 
Uh, Catherine Fortin is an assistant professor of the Netherlands Institute of Human Rights at, at Utrecht University. She has published widely on the legal framework pertaining, uh, pertain, pertaining to non-international armed conflicts and her monograph, The Accountability of, Accountability of Armed Groups Under Human Rights Law, won the 2018 Labour Prize. She serves as executive director, editor, sorry, executive editor of the Netherlands currently of human rights and is an editor of the armed groups and international law blog. She is currently carrying out a three year research project funded by the Netherlands Organization of Scientific Research, the NWO, on civilian agency, armed groups and international law. She is a qualified solicitor in the UK and previously worked at Norton Rose Fulbright the Council of Churches of Sierra Leone, the International Criminal Court, and the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. So that's it for formalities. And now I'm gonna let Laura Inigo Alvarez uh, present her book uh, without any um, other promotions. And like that. Laura, the floor is yours. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, well, good evening to everyone or good afternoon to those in other regions. I would like to uh, first thank Alma Association and Ido for organizing this event and giving me the opportunity to present my book. And I also want to thank the three speakers we will have today for accepting the, the invitation to participate and also to make comments on my book and other related topics. I want to start by explaining a bit the background of the study and then go into some of the main ideas and arguments of the book. And the book examines the question of whether armed groups could be held internationally responsible as a collectivity uh, rather than as individual members and which methodology could be applied to answer this question. As we know, in the last decades, the majority of armed conflict have been of a non-international character so this involves the emergence of different non-state armed groups fighting against the state or against other armed groups. Some of the armed groups involved have gained control over territories and also over the population living in those areas. These groups have also committed continuous and serious violations of international humanitarian law and human rights law as it has been reported by UN and the ICRC and other relevant NGOs. And again, this background, the emergence of armed group has posed uh, several challenges to the state-centric system of international law and has generated many discussions and complex debates. One of these complex issues is the question of the possible international responsibility of armed groups. And although there have been certain scholarly debates on this issue, the question still remains controversial. So this is more or less the starting point. Going into uh, the main ideas of, uh, of the book, the first question that I, that I address in the book is about the necessity of finding a responsibility framework. So why is a responsibility framework for armed groups necessary under international law? Or in other words, why responsibility matters in the first place? And here I identify three main reasons. The first one is the fact that there is a current disconnection between uh, what I call primary and secondary norms. And um, when we talk about armed groups, there is a consensus on the applicability of primary obligations of international humanitarian law, such as uh, common article three of the Geneva Convention, additional protocol two or customary, customary international humanitarian law. The discussions have also addressed the possible human rights obligations of armed groups. And this has been the subject of extensive research by different scholars, including our colleague, Catherine Fortin. And however, there is yet uh, no responsibility framework attached to it or so-called secondary norms for armed groups. And then if armed groups as such have obligations, then the next logical step would be that they could engage their international responsibility. Uh, as it has been pointed out by Professor Alain Pellet, responsibility is the necessary corollary of law. And even in the articles on the state responsibility in the commentary of Article 10, 
the International Law Commission recognized the possibility that an insurrectional movement itself could be held responsible for its own conduct under international law. However, this has not been further developed or operationalized. In my study, I analyzed uh, the reports of UN commissions of inquiry and other fact-finding missions reporting about situations of non-international conflict. And the conclusion uh, about this analysis was that the majority of these commissions, although referring to the international obligations of armed groups as such and their different strategies, in their conclusions, they only uh, consider their responsibility in terms of individual criminal responsibility. There were only uh, two instances that identified that the responsibility of the group as such was recognized. One was the Commission of Inquiry in Darfur that considered the possible international responsibility of the Sudan Liberation Movement Army and the Justice and Equality, and Equality Movement. And the other one was uh, the panel of experts on accountability in Sri Lanka that acknowledged the organizational responsibility of the uh, Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elan for their duties under international humanitarian law on top of the international criminal responsibility. But except these two cases, the rest of the report show this disconnection between primary and secondary norms and this gap in the regulation. The second reason is then linked to the insufficiency of international criminal law to address the whole range of, the whole range of actions of armed groups. As we know, international criminal law only covers the actions of individuals, natural persons, but not of legal persons or groups. However, uh, crimes cannot always uh, be attributed simply to an individual because often there is an organizational structure behind who facilitates and encourages the commission of these violations. Uh, in addition, uh, the crimes that are subject to prosecution of international courts and the ICC are only uh, the most serious violations of the Geneva Convention and the additional protocol. Uh, and those actions that do not reach this threshold will be left unpunished. There are also other procedural barriers, such as the length and high standard of evidence of criminal proceedings, or the fact that the person who committed the violation may also be dead. In the third place, it's the prevention of impunity and the right to reparation of victims. The other side of the coin uh, is the victim rights to reparation for violations committed during armed conflict. And from the point of view of the victim, the suffering caused to them uh, remains the same, irrespective of whether there is a, the perpetrator is a state or a non-state actor. And the difficulties identifying the individual perpetrator should not be an obstacle for providing full reparations to victims. In this regard, um, holding an armed group as a collective entity could have the advantage of targeting the financial and organizational structure of the group. Uh, all these factors indicate this, the existence of a responsibility gap with clashes with the idea of an international legal order governed by the rule of law, which also uh, causes damage to the requirement of legal certainty, transparency, and legitimacy of the international legal order. Once we acknowledge the necessity of responsibility, the next question I address in the book is how, uh, which methodology could we use to cover the actions of armed groups as such? And here I propose to draw inspiration from the codification process of the International Law Commission in relation to the articles on state responsibility and the articles on the responsibility of international organizations. And in this case, the rules of the responsibility of states were simplified and adapted to the characteristics of international organizations. So an analogous approach uh, could be potentially uh, applied to organize some groups. The idea was to identify minimum and core rules of responsibility and in particular of attribution and adapt them to the characteristics of armed groups and also to include what I call non-traditional sources of international law in order to interpret these principles and norms. Um, by non-traditional sources of international law, I include uh, 
the reports of monitoring mechanisms such as UN commissions of inquiry, fact-finding mission, uh, special procedure of the Human Rights Council. But on the other hand, I have also in include the so-called practice uh, of armed groups, uh, which has been addressed by the International Committee of the Red Cross as other practice. Uh, including unilateral declarations, special agreements, codes of conduct, and other internal ruling. So following this reason, in the book, I focus on two uh, main questions that are, are attribution and reparations, because I think these are the two core elements on responsibility where we need to focus the attention uh, as a first step in this study of the question. And as for the rules of attribution of conduct, I will briefly mention the three core rules that um, could be potentially applied uh, to organized and groups according to, to this study. And the first one would be attribution based on the conduct of organs or agents of and groups. And here I propose to take uh, a functional approach and define the organs and agents of and groups as those who perform a continuous role in the organization uh, in a similar way than the definition of agents for international organizations, because I find this notion was more flexible. But uh, in any case, the identification of organs and agents will have to be done on a case by case approach. In the book, I also mentioned some possible indicators and I also analyzed the notion of membership, but I think Later on, maybe Catherine will address these issues. The second norm uh, would be on the, uh, the attribution based on the conduct of other individuals or groups that are under direction and control of the armed groups. And here I discuss the different theories on effective control and overall control. And I make some distinctions between centralized and decentralized types of, of, of armed groups. And the third rule uh, I address is the possible acknowledgement of the conduct as, as it's owned by the group um, by analogy with the article on state responsibility and the responsibility of international organizations. And the last part of the book deals with the, uh, the legal consequences and the obligation to provide reparations to victims. Uh, in this part of the book, I examined different soft law instruments, reports of monitoring mechanisms, and also the own practice of armed groups, including in particular, those peace agreements between states and armed groups. And I also consider a broad definition of reparations, including not only financial compensation, but also uh, symbolic reparation and the question of the right to truth. I concluded uh, that there was an emerging practice uh, which acknowledges the potential role of armed groups in the provision of reparation to victims. Uh, and I also examined whether this practice could have any normative value for the purpose of customary international law. And this is more or less the overview of the question that I discussed in the book. There are, of course, many challenges in this proposal, and, but the main goal was to bring clarity in relation to certain gaps and also to bring uh, to try to clarify certain notions uh, that were controversial or obscure. So for me, I can give the floor now to the commentators and continue later with the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Uh, we're going to start the commentators with Emmanuel Aguilar. Thank you, Ido. And um, first and foremost, congratulations, uh, Laura. I feel we have spent a rainy weekend together. Your book was really a pleasure to read. And um, it is a really important topic that you're addressing. One of my pet peeves is that people tend to focus exclusively on individual criminal responsibility the, uh, the, these days. And part of me wonders whether it's just a generational question and people have grown up in the times of the ICC, so they tend to to overlook or perhaps even be unaware that upstream earlier is the what Francoise refers to as the civil 
responsibilities of, of parties to conflicts, states and, in, and organized armed groups. And for the, the reasons that you highlight in your book, in particular, the fact that this responsibility is far broader, as well as practical considerations, such as it might be impossible to find the people who are responsible for a particular violation of IHL. This is an extremely important aspect of, um, of the law. And it's something we must not overlook when we want to promote compliance with the law, but um, also um, talk about accountability. We really need to look at all elements, all aspects, and take all opportunities in a complementary and also creative manner. While, of course, when we're looking at organized armed groups, recognizing the range of their particularities and differences from states that you highlight in your book. So um, I'm just going to make three points and then a, a conclusion. My first point relates to comparing the situation of organized armed groups to, to those of states. And as I was reading your book, I felt myself saying, unfortunately, the position with regard to states is not quite as developed or as rosy as um, sometimes you make it out to be. Um, and particular in terms of what the book is looking for, which is a, a central singular comprehensive set of rules with regard to the consequences of violations of IHL uh, or public international law more broadly even. We do have the ILC articles in this regard and they reflect customary international law and they are an immensely useful uh, instrument relied upon by courts and in, in many other ways, but they're not binding. Um, so, it's not quite as settled as clear and states have not quite committed to it in a, in a way that would be desirable. In addition, um, looking beyond that, in terms of the mechanisms for holding states accountable, the situation is, is less than ideal, both at the international level and, and even more so perhaps domestically. And then finally, the same holds truth in true in relation to, to reparations, and that's the point I'm going to address right at the end. While I think there is a general acceptance of the obligation to make reparations for violations of IHL, um, it is still very, very rare that this happens in practice. So I'm, I'm noting this right at the outset because unfortunately there is no gold standard that we can aspire to emulate uh, when it comes even to state responsibility, uh, both in terms of what the secondary rules are and also how to, to give effect to them. And this is when we're dealing with states where the situation is far less controversial and many of the practical challenges that you flagged in your book do not in fact arise. That said, if we look at um, the situation of organized armed groups, what is it we actually need? Um, is it an absence of clear rules on their secondary responsibility? And if so, why? And I found myself saying, um, is it because intrinsically they don't exist? Or is it for other reasons that we don't see them spelled out? And I feel it's for other reasons. So for example, there's no clear institutional home for their development until now. Um, the ILC didn't address it in the articles on state responsibility, but not because it didn't think that there was secondary responsibility, just because it was looking at the issue through the lens of the responsibility of states. And apart from the couple of situations that it addresses there, that was just not the right moment to look at it. Less so, um, even less so the articles on the responsibility of international organizations. I also think there's been fewer opportunities for this to be addressed by the courts. So this is possibly why we don't find something. And I felt myself saying, um, I don't think there's a gap, but I am with you when I say, oh, it would be desirable to have far greater clarity. There's a need for far greater clarity. And then I say, okay, what areas would I like greater clarity with respect to? And I feel that maybe I've drunk the Kool-Aid, but I don't feel that there's a need to clarify whether or not they are in fact responsible if they have violated 
the law, it seems pretty clear to me that, that this is the case. Um, and perhaps this is the one area of substantively that I disagree with you, is that um, although we might have seen fewer instances of the courts holding groups accountable, I actually think that group responsibility precedes the responsibility of individual members. It's an interesting relationship to look at, but I would definitely say group responsibility is something that exists, is well established, even though we don't actually see it in the courts, but interesting point to discuss. To discuss. Um, I would, in this regard, I, in, I, I would take what the various missions say in this regard and the fact that they focus on the accountability of individuals with a large pinch of salt, quite frankly. Why, at times, they're stuck with a mandate, which is really less than desirable in terms of how it is framed and pushes them to look at individual criminal responsibility and accountability. Part of me sometimes wonders whether they're even aware of the fact that it's possibility to not look at individual criminal responsibility, individual responsibility, and to look at that of the group. So I would say it was fascinating to look at the analysis, but I wouldn't, on the basis of that, reach any conclusion. Um, I would say that what definitely needs clarification is when groups are responsible. And a key question that is definitely under analyzed is the question of attribution. And you've looked at it in the book and I really enjoyed that. And I know Catherine is going to consider this in detail, but I just wanted to have flag a couple, one reflection on one possible basis for attribution, which is the membership of the group. And that's obviously one key possible basis. But in, when we come to discussing membership, we need to be careful because membership is used for a variety of different purposes. Um, membership is relevant to determine whether a group even exists, and that of itself is relevant for determining whether IHL is applicable. Membership of the group is relevant for targeting purposes, and that's where we have the, the, the discussion of continuous combat function, in, according to some people, membership more broadly. And I think it's with regard to this that a distinction was drawn between the political and the military wings of organized armed groups. Membership might even be relevant for the nexus um, in determining whether there is a war crime. And finally, membership association affiliation is something that we're also seeing for other purposes, particularly for um, counterterrorism measures that apply very broadly. And we need to be careful because the approach we adopt with regard to one of these purposes is not necessarily appropriate or relevant for other purposes and we shouldn't conflate and I'm not suggesting you do but I'm saying this is something that we really need to to unpack quite carefully and you suggest indicators at one point for, for the membership and I think that's a very useful way to go and then my final point relates um, to the reparations dimension. And here, we're really not in a good place, even when it comes to state, to states. And um, I think that there's general acceptance um, that states have an obligation to make reparations. And interestingly, there's also a general acceptance of the right of victims to reparations. But at present, I feel that there's a, a disconnect between the two of them. Um, there have been very, very few instances where absent some kind of special uh, arrangement or uh, reliance on human rights instruments and mechanisms that individual victims have received compensation, reparations. And I really enjoyed looking at your actual practice. Um, and then it was interesting to see that when you got to the end of each paragraph, it almost ended with a, regrettably, this has not actually led to to payments. And that's um, the situation with states. What about organized armed groups? And as I was thinking about it, I was going, well, as a matter of law, they might actually have fewer places to hide. For example, there's no arguments of sovereign in, uh, immunity that could be raised before domestic courts. And in fact, we've seen more ICC prosecutions of um, members of organized armed groups. But then as you correctly pointed out, I think we have some very practical limitations or constraints. 
And again, when we come to reparations, we've got to get very practical. And for example, do they have funds? Because what's the point of going after them if they don't ultimately have funds? The fact that they've ceased to exist might not actually be such a big issue on the funds front because they might have left pots of money behind as, as might have been the case with some, some groups. And this is where I think we need to be creative um, when we're looking at how to get our hands on, on those funds for victims. Um, and I think uh, there's been interesting litigation before domestic courts. You'll be familiar with what um, uh, a great NGO in the UK is doing, Redress. They are looking at ways of attaching uh, assets that might have been frozen under sanctions against individuals or groups and using those to provide reparations to victims of violations of, of IHL human rights. Um, and I think that's a really interesting approach and something we should look at in, in terms of going forwards. And then finally, I think we've got to be careful with, we shouldn't focus exclusively on compensation. Um, there's many other aspects of reparations that are very important. Um, I was told to avoid the word symbolic because moral compensation can be really, really important to, to the victims themselves, to their communities and towards uh, reconciliation. So that dimension is very important. And finally, um, guarantees of non-repetition. And it's something we haven't really looked at, but I'd say in our engagement with organized armed groups, that's really, really important because we want a change of practice. And you mentioned the, the, the example of the plans of action that the SRSG for Children in Armed Conflict is taking. I would love to see more of that. Do all, I think my time's up. Um, conclusions. And my conclusions are, how do we take this forward at two levels? First, in terms of clarifying the law, who's going to do it? And I think it's unlikely to be the ILC. Um, in any event, would we want it to be the ILC? It's going to be very straight driven. It's going to be conservative. And as you say, I thought it was a really interesting point you flagged that some states consider non-state armed groups illegal. Would they even want to go there? So if not the ILC, who? And then, when it comes to implementing the law, we need to look at every possible angle, um, be complementary and be creative. But thanks for a phenomenal book. Thank you, Manuel. And now we're moving to Ezekiel. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Ido. And, and first of all, um, to, to words of appreciation, first to Alma for organizing this, and also for uh, to Laura, a, a big congratulations on the book, uh, which is a result of a PhD. So uh, congratulations twice on the PhD and on the book. Uh, I thought it was it, it was fascinating. Uh, I think that the topic in itself is 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 great. Uh, I'm not going to repeat what uh, Emanuela just said, but um, it is it is a fantastic topic of analysis, and this is. I think it's it's one of these topics that it's actually uh, I have the feeling that when talking about armed groups, um, maybe 20 or 30 years ago, um, people were discussing about first about IHL and how the law of international humanitarian law would apply to armed groups, the reasons why international humanitarian law would apply to armed groups. And then um, in the last 20 years, uh, people, including Catherine, have discussed about uh, other branches and how other branches of international law apply to armed groups such as international human rights law. And I have the feeling that in the last few years, discussions have shifted towards um, the topics that are not so, um, I don't want to say clear cut, but I would say that they don't have, a, there is no a, explicit regulation uh, in terms of the behavior of armed groups. And I'm saying this because there are some human rights uh, law treaties that address um, armed groups themselves. But, there are some kind of uh, spaces and, and spheres where no clear regulation exists. And, and I have the feeling that one of them is, is the law of international responsibility. And I find that it is very interesting because when we take uh, the articles on state responsibility um, and we see that the, the, the first article, it says that every internationally wrongful act uh, entails a responsibility of states. And, and then we go to the second uh, article of the, of the articles on state responsibility and it says that uh, these actually inter 
international wrongful acts are uh, actions or omissions that entail that are attributable to the state and are a breach of international law. And when we take that, we say, okay, armed groups, they actually um, they, 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 they breach international obligations. They are situations of respect as well, but they might breach their international obligations. And uh, international institutions and bodies, they have attributed uh, these, these violations to armed groups for many years. I mean, you mentioned, uh, you give a few examples in the book, uh, commissions of inquiry and, and uh, also uh, truth commissions and also um, the, the UN special, uh, special representative of the Secretary General on Chile and armed conflict, they, uh, which uh, actually, uh, you know, it's like every year the Secretary General publishes uh, a list of uh, states and non-state armed groups that um, violate one or more of the six grave violations against children. So there is an issue of attribution there. There is a clear issue of attribution and there is a clear issue of, of breaching international obligations. So the question is what, I mean, which I think you, you, you deal uh, thoroughly in your book is what are the rules behind these attributions and, and uh, what are the rules afterwards with respect to the possible reparations by, by, by young groups? So I think it is, it is a quite an important uh, topic uh, also in terms of um, the, the situation of the victims um also well i mean a, a few of these resources were, were mentioned by manuel before but i think uh clearly it is it is relevant because most of people have focused on individual responsibility and, and courts and tribunals have dealt with individual responsibility or state responsibility but not um little studies few studies have have done with respect to the accountability of armed groups you mentioned uh, sectel in your in your book uh, but, but since then, uh, very few studies have been made in this respect. We, I mean, even when we have international institutions dealing with this issue. So it is clearly needed. Um, this is despite the fact that there are a few challenges when dealing with responsibility of armed groups. And the problem is, um, and I'm going to address this in my, in my following point as well, as um, the, the seemingly existing rules deal with states and international organizations. And again, you mentioned some of these challenges in the book, and I want to highlight them because I think they are quite relevant. I mean, for instance, um, when we speak about states, uh, we have, of course, the Montevideo Convention that provides four elements. And when these four elements are present, then you have states. When we deal with armed groups, there is no uniform definition of what an armed group is. There is actually no definition under international law whatsoever. So when we speak about um, reparations, attributions, etc., I mean, I think this is one of the points in which international law kind of see, sees this issue in a, in a compartmentalized way. So uh, in the end, it depends on the scope and mandate of each institution dealing with armed groups. And this is one, one of the challenges because coming with international rules applying to, to all armed groups, even if they are minimum, can be quite challenging. The second one is um, there is also, and this specifically deals with, with reparations, even though we, have, we, we may have some practice, and I'm gonna come back to this point later, but even when we may have some practice and we might take, um, we, we may apply the rules of states and, non, and, and international organizations, even if we adapt them, as you propose. I think the other challenge is the lack of willingness. Some may, some our groups may not be willing to provide any reparation. And, and I'm not even speaking after the conflict because armed groups may disappear after the conflict or they may become a different entity. But even during the conflict, they might uh, breach international obligations. They might actually claim responsibility for these obligations and they might deliberately not provide any reparation. So, and the third challenge that I wanna, I wanna actually uh, highlight is, I, I always think that there is a problem when we take as a starting point, um, the rules applicable to states or other non-state actors such as international organizations. And I know that, I have done this in the past myself, and I think now that I'm trying to reflect a bit uh, on this, I think it can be quite challenging because the features of these entities are different. So not only non-state armed groups are illegal under domestic law, but I mean, of course, some non-state armed groups may exist with the support and, and assistance of certain states. But leaving aside the, the feature, the kind of the illegal nature of the groups, I think that the the the, the one of the challenges is that they're temporal entities by nature. So um, 
they exist for a certain purpose. Again, it depends on the definition that we take for non-state armed groups. But if we take the definition that they exist in connection to an armed conflict, it can be challenging then to say, um, to expect that these rules may, may, may apply. Or if they apply, they will only apply, arguably, during the conflict. Well, it, it, this is the temporal scope in which the armed group would exist. Having said this, I think it's very, it was very bold, um, a, a bold move from your side to suggest to take into account the practice uh, of armed groups in, this, in these realms. And, um, and I think this is, it's kind of, um, it's key when dealing with the, the, the law applicable to armed groups is to actually to see what they have to say about this law. I mean, and how they put the rule into practice. Um, I think the challenge is, again, that we come back from, I think this is the way we, we were taught international law, we kind of come from, from a state perspective. We want, I mean, the first step is actually to see what the rules of state responsibility say. And then from there, we see what armed groups do. I don't know, I'm just dropping the question here. It might, it might be that we actually have to see what armed groups, I mean, it is a structural question. I think, I know it's, we kind of need structures, you know, it's like we kind of need boxes You see, okay, this is a compensation and you know why do we call it compensation well because compensation it is what's called you know it's like a, this article of state responsibility and the practice of states before we say satisfaction you know like again and we come with these boxes that that the international law applicable to states give us and and we try to fit the practice of armed groups there and uh, and i think it's quite challenging i'm not saying other people have suggested to come up with, with rules uh, created by and developed for armed groups. Um, I think um, this is kind of a challenging, a challenging uh, move. But in any case, I think it might be worth to, even though I think it is quite important to, to analyze their practices, to analyze their practices not only through the lens of international law that was developed for states. Even though I agree with Manu that the rules of state responsibility are, are challenging per se. Um, so this is this. In any case, I think that was a bold move, and I think is 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 actually needed in the study uh, in the studies in the existing studies of, of armed groups practices. The last point that I want to make um, is mostly regarding the reasons why um, armed groups may behave in certain ways or another. So and I'm, I'm going to take the two points that you you actually address in your book, which are attribution and reparation. So. And, and I'd like to, to actually uh, hear what you, what you have to say about these issues. And, and for me, it's actually, um, as, as you know, working for a humanitarian organization that engages armed groups. And, uh, you know, it's like at Geneva, Co, we go to the field and we talk to the groups to try to, to kind of convince them to comply with international law. And we have uh, different tools to do so, such as a deed of commitment, which is a, uh, and a unilateral declaration, and you mentioned this in, in your book. We uh, thank you very much for that. It's like it's a unilateral declaration uh, that armed groups can sign, and they commit to respect certain obligations. So the the point is, um, we also, I mean, the, the interesting part of the analysis is not only the rules as such, is um, why armed groups behave in certain ways or in other. So it's like if if you have an armed group that claims responsibility, so why is the armed group doing so? If you have an armed group that is providing a reparation during the conflict, why is, is the armed group doing so? I mean, um, because for instance, and, and this, is, this is just a quick thought I had when, when going through your book, I have the feeling that maybe some groups, uh, for instance, there might be a link between the humanitarian commitments that a group uh, does with, um, with the reparations that it undertakes. So some of the practice that, that you actually highlight in your book are related to special agreements, as you say, the non-traditional sources, you know, special agreements, um, you know, internal internal codes and uh, military codes, etc., uh, in which, for instance, issues such as attribution of reparations are included. So my question is whether there is a link between the the, the, the willingness of the group to to actually undertake a humanitarian commitment and the, the, also their willingness to provide reparations. And uh, for instance, um, it is interesting because. During peace processes, for instance, um, armed groups may be more open to discuss certain humanitarian issues. And uh, this is also the moment in which they may also discuss reparations or attribution. They may actually, you know, um, decide to claim responsibility for certain acts. So 
it's, it's interesting because, for instance, in Colombia, a couple of days ago, there was a statement by the FARC uh, apologizing for the, the kidnappings during the conflict. So, and this is a post-conflict situation. I mean, the FARC is no longer an armed group as such. The, I mean, I'm speaking about the FARC that, that was part of the peace agreement that was signed in 2016. But there might be a correlation between the different practices. And I think uh, this is kind of an issue that I, I, I think it, it, it would be worth to, ex to further explore in the future is uh, whether reparation and, and claim your responsibility as a way of attribution um, they have a link to, to the other behaviors of the group. And I, and also, you know, the reasons, what type of groups may be, may, may be more open to do this. So um, this is the, the last point that I want to make, but perhaps um, I, I always, you know, there is a study on compliant levels that a political scientist from the US did a couple of years ago, and she identified certain elements that are present in, a, in, in armed groups that are more willing to respect international law such as, for instance, uh, and th these groups are uh, legitimacy seekers. You know, they look for legitimacy under international law, under domestic law. So I, I, I wonder if actually these elements, you know, that there, are, there is a, a political uh, wing within the group or that the group has a successionist goal. I wonder if these elements from a, from a behavioral perspective, they also have some weight when addressing their behaviors in terms of reparation and in terms of claiming responsibility. and. Um, I, I tend to believe that they do. So armed groups, they may, more, they, they be, may be more willing to claim responsibility or and provide actually provide uh, reparations. For instance, if they have a certain political goal, if they want to achieve a certain recognition at the international level, if they want to become a political party after the, after the conflict, if they want to uh, get acceptance by local stakeholders. So actually, if they want to gain support from local constituencies, they might be more willing to actually uh, you know, it's like ask for forgiveness to that from that local constituency. Same at the international level. If they want to gain um, recognition at the international realm or support during peace process, uh, during a peace process, they might, more, they, they might be more willing to speak about the violations that they committed. And by doing so, they might actually provide in a sort of reparation, such as moral reparations, as, as Manuela said, or, you know, it's a, a measure of satisfaction. So I think there might be a correlation there. And I think what your book did was kind of to, 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 to open um, these, these discussions that I think as a, as a humanitarian practitioner, I think they, these discussions are needed because again, peace processes or, you know, it's like this, this type of, uh, there are certain moments, certain windows of opportunities, of opportunity in which humanitarian actors may engage uh, with, with armed groups. And uh, yeah, I, I think this, this should be part of those discussions as well. Um, having said that, it's, uh, I think I'm, I'm running out of time and, uh, um, yes, thank you very much for, for your time. Thank you, Ezekiel. And now we go to Katharine. Um, thank you. Um, well, I'd just like to add my congratulations, Laura, to your book, um, and, um, I, I, of course, in full disclosure, um, was one of Laura's PhD supervisors for the manuscript that became the book. And Cedric, I see, is Cedric Reinhardt, who is the co-supervisor, is also in the audience, um, I see. So we're both here, so that's nice. Um, so Laura and I have had lots of conversations uh, about this issue over the years. and um, But that's not to say that there aren't still loads of conversations, I think, Laura and I, that you and I can still have on it. And it's also not to say that we necessarily have the same view on all the issues in the book. So I was very pleased that you invited me to take part in the panel. And uh, thank you also to Ido and to Alma for hosting this event. Um, I think probably because I, I've, um, I do know the book, I'm going to, rather than doing such a far and impressive ranging review that Ezekiel and Emanuela just did, I'm going to look quite closely actually just on two issues. And you asked me specifically to speak about rebel governance. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, and I'm going to speak to it really uh, at two levels. First of all, I'm going to talk about it in a factual sense, um, raising some of the legal questions that I think um, come up um, with rebel go governance that seem to me to be particularly pertinent. And I, I'm just going to raise some questions that I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on. Um, and secondly, I'd like to talk about rebel governance as a body of literature. 
um, a body of scholarship, which is, of course, as you know, just really emerging right now and has been emerging over the last few years. So um, I'm guessing most people know what we're talking about when we talk about rebel governance, but I'll just kind of run through what we are just in case. So rebel governance is, of course, talking about the provision of uh, the regulation of life and provision of public services by armed groups. And there's been a lot of research done on this over the last years, actually really an explosion of research by political scientists and anthropologists, among others, really documenting what armed groups do when they control territory and why they do it. Um, so asking quite different questions to questions that as lawyers we are often ask. Um, and this has been a very rich body of literature, um, which I know that I've studied in my work and you have also studied in your work. So this literature notes that when armed groups perform government functions, um, they often need to establish institutions to do so. So separate institutions from their military. Um, and the, the literature kind of notes that those institutions may, may indeed be separate from the military or may be contained within the military wing. Um, and the literature also notes that, you know, armed groups are, um, are carrying out a massive range of public services. Um, um, so ranging from kind of security to healthcare to education to food production to distribution, land management, providing housing, shelter, public resources, um, civil disputes, debt, met debt, debt matters, domestic violence, drug use, all of this. Um, and of course, we've got, you know, a number of key examples that I think many of us are familiar with. Um, the Islamic State is probably the one which had the most headlines. Um, and there, there's also been, you know, a lot of studies emerging in the Islamic State, but we've also got them on the LTTE, on um, the Colombia, on the Syrian interim government. Um, very interesting. Now, I think figuring out how the civilian wing of an armed group, so the entity or the institutions providing these services, fits into the legal framework is a particularly difficult issue um, because it hasn't actually been addressed that much in case law. Um, or legal literature. Now, I want to focus here on um, the position you take in your book on this. Um, and so you take the view that the political or civilian wing of armed groups isn't really part of the armed group for the purposes of a non-international armed conflict. And, and you take the view that, um, so you take the view it's not part of the entity that makes up the non-state party. Um, and you justify that view by referring to the definition of organized armed groups, which is provided from, by the ICRC in its um, glossary of terms. And I think we can agree that that definition, which um, is the one which basically, uh, let me see, it's the one that says, it refers exclusively to the armed or military wing of a non-state party to a non-international armed conflict. And it then adds you know, that this excludes the political wing. That definition comes more or less from the ICRC's DPH study. Um, so if you look at the DPH study, you can, one of the first things they had to do was, of course, to kind of sketch out what they meant by an organized armed group. And that was the definition more or less that they came up with. But you also justify this view with the definition of organized armed groups um, in scholarship. And you point to scholarship that indicates that non-international armed conflicts are actually fought between the armed forces of states on the one hand and the military wings of non-state armed groups on the other. And I think to some extent, you don't mention this, but I think to some extent, one could find further support for this position by looking at the case law on the organization requirement that we see from the ICTY and from the IC, which indeed, if you look at it carefully, only does seem to pay attention to indicators which relate to an armed group's military wing. Um, now, of course, the starting definition for you is important to your study of attribution. It's important because it feeds into the extent to which the political wing is considered to be part of the armed group for the purposes of attributing IHL violations. So on the one hand, it's relevant to determining whether the political wing is part of the legal entity that bears that responsibility and on the other hand, it then becomes important because it's relevant for your determination of how the notion of agents and organs can be applied to armed groups. Because as part of that inquiry, you have to ask the question, well, the agents of what entity, of what legal entity and the, the organs of what legal identity. And then later you come up, I think, 
um, rightly with the, the notion of function. So then the question you have to ask is the functions of what legal entity, because you indeed indicate that there should be a link between the conduct of the agents or the individual and the functioning of the group. So you need to find out who the group is in order to figure out what its functioning is. And the question then is, are we only talking about its military functioning or are we also talking about its civilian functioning? So in your book, you go on to look at the notion of agents and organs more closely. And you indeed, as um, Emmanuel already indicated, you helpfully come up with these indicators. And I think that this is a helpful analysis that can help us identify and link individuals with the group. So some of the indicators you give include where the individual sits within a particular military unit, um, who their commander is, whether they sit within the chain of command, um, uniforms, weapons, training. And then as Emanuela also went on, and this is where I'm going to expand probably a bit more, you go on to consider the relevance of membership um, to attribution. And by membership, then you are indeed referring to the notion developed in the ICRC CPH study. So this was, of course, a study that was developed um, specifically for the purposes of targeting. Um, and you point out in your analysis of this guidance that um, that this study had a, a specific purpose. The word membership in the study had a specific purpose. You also um, point out literature, which indicates that that definition is too narrow. And you conclude, and I, I agree with this conclusion, that the ICRC guidance should only be used for the purposes of determining legitimate military targets, as it appears too narrow to reflect the full spectrum of members of an armed group, as it might be relevant to attribution. So now I'm finally coming to my question for you, which is that if you consider the membership criteria that emerges from the DPH study to be too narrow, um, and you think it's possible to develop a different membership criteria for attribution, does it remain logical or perhaps necessary to adopt that starting definition of an organized armed group that also essentially came from the DPH study? i.e. that foundational idea that it refers exclusively to the armed or military wing of a non-state um, party to a non-international conflict. Um, might it be possible or perhaps more sensible to take a different definition of organized armed groups when thinking about armed non-state groups as parties? Um, and my second question, which is related, is to kind of I suppose, go along a similar line of thinking just a bit more, which is you point out that according to the literature, some armed groups, um, individuals have mixed function and that you can have um, some organs also which have a mixed function, both civilian and military. Um, but now just for the sake of, of, of thinking this through, let's imagine that we have an armed group with a very clear and separate civilian wing I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Would the actions, if we take your starting point of the definition of the group, would the actions of a member of that civilian wing be able to be attributed to that group? Um, and if not, don't we have a problem of a sort of accountability gap? So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, on that. Um, I've also, I want to end, as I indicated before, by having a look uh, at the, um, the, the rebel go governance field in general. And I think what's really interesting about that field is that a lot of it has been written sort of in tandem to the legal literature and there haven't been that many contact points between them. So, of course, lawyers like me have kind of used their literature in, 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 in order to bring um, to light sort of what's happening on the ground and shed light on on different dynamics and you've of course done that very specifically looking at the structure of armed groups as well but i'm I, it occurs to me that there could be real potential in doing some kind of interdisciplinary study um, and I, I wanted to ask you are there any specific areas of law or legal questions or issues relating to armed groups and international law where you think scholars from law political science anthropology or other disciplines working on rebel governance should be actually working together um, maybe this is an issue that you feel still needs some work within your own study or maybe this is um, somewhere outside your study but i'd be very curious to hear your thoughts thank you catherine um, and now we move to laura's response 
Yeah. Well, thank you all for the uh, insightful comments and questions. Um, I see it's a very complex issue and there are so many layers to it. And it's good because every time I hear uh, someone uh, reflecting about this issue, I hear a different perspective to it that maybe I haven't, th I haven't thought about it. And starting with the comments of Emanuela and um, on the question of um, if it's really what we need are rules. Um, my first idea when I started uh, looking into uh, the question of armed groups is when I was uh, looking into all the reports of UN commissions of inquiry um, and all the fact finding mission. And so there was um, um, more and more interest on the actions of armed groups and the violations. And then in, this, in these reports, you can see a clear distinction between state violations and non-state uh, armed groups violations. Uh, but then for me, what I was missing, it was really a clear explanation between uh, the link between those obligations that were violated by armed groups and how um, this commission attribute them to a specific armed groups. Because as you said, if uh, group responsibility is first, then why in the conclusions you only dealt with individual criminal responsibility? And then, and this issue uh, you can see also in the work of truth and reconciliation commissions that I also analyzed some of the, the reports in the, in the commission in El Salvador, Guatemala, Liberia, Peru, and Sierra Leone. And here you see that it's the same, that they, are, they also refer to the different obligations and actions of armed groups during the armed conflict. But they, uh, again, in the conclusions, they only refer to this individual criminal responsibility. And actually there is one, the Truth Commission in El Salvador, that acknowledge uh, also the, the own responsibility of the group. And um, it tried to explain the link between their members and the group. So for me, that was this first idea that um, on the one hand, uh, the responsibility of, of the state was clearly established, but then there was this uh, legal, uh, there was not legal certainty and transparency about how these violations were reported. And, you also pointed out that maybe the starting point of looking at the, the state's uh, the state articles on responsibility, maybe it's, it's not ideal because um, uh, in some cases, uh, states are not found uh, responsible. Um, here I wanted to, to mention that um, when you look at the drafting process of the uh, articles on state responsibility, and that is something that I also, uh, I also did in the book. Um, you see that the, the notion of responsibility or international responsibility has not been created out of the blue by, by the International Law Commission because they also, um, it was also based, as you said, in, this, in the notion of civil responsibility and uh, particularly on the notion of extra contractual civil responsibility from the civil codes of uh, European uh, countries, uh, mostly. And then um, the other notion implicit, it was the notion of rep uh, reprisals as well. So um, the origin of international responsibility, even though it's like a sui generis type of responsibility, has also is based on, on the more uh, civil responsibility. The other idea is, as you also mentioned, is that the articles on state responsibility also uh, have a customary. Um, they have been conceived now as a part of customary international law. And uh, the other reason is that the notion of uh, attributing a violation is not only uh, based on state responsibility, but uh, also for international criminal law, it's also based on the idea of a violation and what are the consequences. So in the end, uh, it could be said that there's a common idea of, inter of responsibility. So that was uh, the reason of the starting point from the state responsibility articles and the articles on the international organizations. And you also commented on the practical challenges for reparations. 
And um, is it true that uh, there are many different challenges, whether the armed group is eliminated or um, which enforcement mechanism, whether there are funds. And uh, the idea of the book was also uh, about understanding that armed group could, all, uh, could actually contribute to different forms of reparations, including, as you said, moral or symbolic reparations. And here, I think um, the, um, there is a big role for armed groups that could play uh, by acknowledging the facts, offering apologies to victims, the right to truth, even participating in rehabilitation programs in those communities where the actions uh, had a bigger impact. And I mentioned two uh, peace agreements, the Darfur peace agreement and the recent a. Uh, peace agreement in Colombia, because even though in the case of Darfur, the Compensation Commission was not established, it could uh, be seen as, a, as an example for future reference. And in, with the case uh, of the peace agreement uh, in Colombia, um, I think it's, it's a good example to see that the first time that an armed group is committing to provide reparation to victims and whether we could see this example in the future. Uh, in any case, I would say we can certainly learn from these examples. Um, I agree there is a potential role on guarantees of non-repetition. And I think this is a key component of reparation and could be crucial considering uh, the actions of, of armed groups. Uh, in the book, I pointed out that um, uh, any commitment by armed groups should be followed by a monitoring mechanism. So uh, if we look at uh, possible guarantees of non-repetition, uh, organizations such as Geneva Call could also have a role to play in monitoring this, uh, these commitments, whether this is a system of um, where the armed group is reporting the positive steps, steps that is, is taken uh, to prevent the future commission of violations, or whether it's also based on verification missions um, by international organization or other humanitarian organizations. Um, if I uh, re uh, remember correctly, I think the last question of Emanuela was on who uh, is gonna prepare these rules. So I agree with you that um, the International Law Commission is very, <laughs> I doubt that the International Law Commission would take this role because uh, it's too focused on uh, states. Um, but um, possibly there could be some uh, guidelines or soft law initiatives by other institutions um, or uh, working groups. Uh, the International Law Association has certain working groups on non-state actors and reparation, whether they could uh, provide uh, in-depth analysis. But I am also thinking that other initiatives uh, that took place also in Geneva, especially also uh, with Geneva called uh, the Garon Stocks, where you have um, this forum where different stakeholders can offer the views on a specific matter of humanitarian norms, whether we could have a similar forum in relation to responsibility. Um, other projects, the Viewpoints project, they also deal with the question of peace agreements and uh, it took the views of different stakeholders. So uh, one possibility could be to offer certain guidelines as a sort of soft law uh, instruments, I would say. Um, now going with Ezequiel, and there are so many <laughs> questions and things that I want to say. Um, I agree with most of the points raised with Ezequiel and I know he has been uh, working on, the, on this topic for, for many years. And he mentioned that there are many also challenges such as, uh, I think the typology of armed groups. And in the book, I tried to offer another layer to this question about the possibility, about the diversity or structural disparity of, of armed groups by adding the question of centralized and decentralized uh, armed groups. So maybe this could be a possible way to have uh, common rules for armed groups, for all armed groups. 
and maybe uh, special rules for uh, different types of armed groups. And this is something that were, was also raised in the articles on international organization, where uh, some of the comments said that uh, international organizations were so uh, diverse that it was not possible to um, uh, come up with common rules. So maybe there is room to have uh, some uh, common or minimum rules and then special rules depending on the typology of, of uh, certain armed groups, at least considering the main uh, structural um, organization. And Ezequiel also uh, said that one of the main challenges is the lack of uh, willingness of armed groups to provide reparations and yeah, I would say this is a main difficulty uh, in general with um, groups, even with all the commitments. And I would say we need more engagement with armed groups in terms of educating them about the different legal frameworks, their obligations, and maybe also not only in, about primary rules, but um, also about the possible responsibilities and they will face I also agree with Ezekiel that considering the practices of armed groups, um, it's key to understand uh, what are the actual capabilities on that commitment. And I actually uh, incorporate the practices of, of armed groups uh, in the question of reparations because I found that there were certain examples uh, where um, at least some armed groups had tried to provide uh, some form of reparations, um, or at least committed to provide some form of reparation that I mentioned, the idea that some of those conducts of armed groups have also considered restitution and compensation uh, for the damage uh, caused to civilian populations. So this is, a simil uh, is similar to the components of reparations for states. And again, the idea of um, formal apologies. Um, there have been certain examples of armed groups uh, providing apologies. Um, we see in Sierra Leone, in Colombia, in Ireland. So um, I think the practices of armed groups are not only relevant for the purpose of the possible normative value, but also for uh, the lessons we can learn and how we can in, we can engage with armed groups. Um, the last thing you uh, said was about whether um, the armed groups are willing to commit to humanitarian dialogues will be more likely to commit to provide reparations. And I agree with this. I think the, that there will be more chances that armed groups which have been already engaging in other humanitarian dialogues Will be yeah. We will uh, will be more likely to accept the responsibility uh, for reparations. But I agree that maybe there are some motivations behind because in some of the cases that I analyze in peace agreements, uh, there could be a transition into becoming a political party. So maybe this is the reasoning behind, or because they wanted to gain international recognition, uh, for instance. So I agree with Ezekiel that there is, there is, um, we require, there is uh, more uh, attention that they need to be put on the issue of humanitarian dialogues and further commitment about reparations. Lastly, about uh, comments on Catherine, uh, I think this is uh, probably uh, the most um, the most difficult part because it's about the own definition of armed groups and the question of attribution that to be honest this has been the the most challenging um, part in the in the thesis um as you said um the main basis was to um decide uh whether i consider uh only the military wins or the and also the the political win and uh, it's, it's true that I took uh, maybe a narrow approach because I was mainly looking at international humanitarian law violations. So I follow uh, most of the uh, definitions by the ICRC, as you as you mentioned, considering and the only the military or armed win. 
And however, it is true that I acknowledge that um, it is difficult sometimes to, um, to distinguish the different roles that members are playing. And as you said as well, sometimes uh, one member can be performing both military and, and also uh, political or administrative functions. And in the book, I mentioned the example of the Sudan People Liberation Movement Army, whether the, of the officer of the Sudan People Liberation Army were performing uh, both military and political functions and also uh, with the FARC. So um, I think in practice, sometimes it's very difficult to make a clear distinction between both branches of the military and the political. And I would say, um, I have more research is needed into clearly distinguish between the different functions in an, in an armed group. Um, in relation as well to the, the question of membership and the definition that is offered by the ICRC guidance on direct participation in hostilities and also responding to, to Emanuela, I agree that the notion of membership uh, doesn't have to be the same for, for all purposes. And here I, I mentioned that um, the notion of membership uh, in this case uh, is narrow because it looks at uh, the idea of determining the, uh, the legitimate military targets, whether the definition of membership for attributed international responsibility does not to have been the same. And uh, the, the idea, um, when you ask me about whether it's too narrow, this definition, um, my, my reasoning here is because it didn't um, take into account other supportive roles and that could be on the on logistics on training and providing services that are actually contributed to the military and armed activities but are not considered as members according to the guidelines so um, my idea was that uh, not only those activities that are and playing a continuous combat function, but other indirect roles could also be part of these military activities. And the question of the civilian members, it's true that I haven't really considered in the book because I mainly focus on those um, organs or members that were playing any particular role in the military activities. So, I would say this is something I have to, to look into, into this uh, in the future. What I pointed out in the book is that um, civilians could actually um, be considered as members for the purpose of responsibility in the case that they were acting under direction and control of the armed group. So this is one of the possibilities of considering civilian as part of the, of the of the armed groups. And I think also the Commission of Inquiry in Syria mentioned something about the Syrian civilian reinforcing anti-government anti armed groups. And I think just quickly, lastly, about the possible research agenda about um, rebel governance and law. I definitely think um, the research on rebel governance uh, could be really useful for international law researchers. Uh, especially uh, if they can offer more examples about what are the actual roles that armed groups are playing in the territories and especially towards the population under, under their control. And I would say the more an armed group resembles um, the function and structures of a, of a state, then the easier will be to argue for the application of international responsibility to that entity. So yes, these are more or less my comments on the comments. And yes, if anyone had questions. Okay, uh, thank you, Laura. Uh, we have a couple of questions uh, in line. And I think we're gonna take uh, both of them and then uh, we'll see how much time we have, if we have for another round. Uh, uh, the second question is gonna be from Ezekiel. But the first question is from uh, Eduardo Vaca uh, from University of Nottingham. 
who asked me to ask the question on his behalf. And he says that, are there specific challenges you identified in relation to decentralized the, to just decentralized on groups in terms of fitting the definition of on groups and fitting in the frameworks for attribution and responsibility you developed? Um, I can ask, I can reply now or? or uh, I think we're going to take uh, Ezekiel's question uh, if, you, if it's okay with you. Yes. We'll take uh, Ezekiel's question as well, and then you can answer both of them. And I think I'm not sure that we'll have uh, more time for other questions. Okay. Ezekiel? Okay, I was muted. Uh, I actually, I want to I wanna follow up on, on Catherine's question. I think it was um, it, it was a very good, and, and uh, your reply, of course, is, uh, yeah, it's, it actually clarifies a lot. But you know, one thing that uh, caught my attention is that you do that analysis for attribution, but not for reparation. Correct me if I'm wrong, maybe I missed something. So um, you do the, I mean, yeah, I mean, who can, actually provide reparation on behalf of the group. So my question is whether you would apply the same standard for the individual apologizing or give you a compensation. I mean, would it have to come necessarily from the military wing or mm. those who are supporting the military activities of the group? Or if a, a member of the civilian wing of the group, the civilian branch publicly apologizes, does it reflect the position of the group in your view or, or yeah? I mean, what, that, that was my question. Thank you. Yes, um, about the question about if I'm correct, whether um, how the notion of decentralized arm group fits into the definition of arm groups. Okay. Yes, um, I think again one of the most the most challenging parts was about. Um, distinguishing between centralized and decentralized. And I think the most challenging part about decentralized and groups is whether um, you consider these different cells or units as part of the armed group or whether they can be considered as independent armed groups. And this also uh, links to the question on, on the own definition of armed group and the own definition of organizations. And, but the, this is also an issue for attribution. And in the book, uh, my take on this was that there could be decentralized some groups um, uh, if there is a coordinating powers uh, from the leadership. So even though the local commander retains much of the power of decisions, um, the main factor would be whether there are some coordination powers and authority from the leadership towards these other units. But in fact, I think this is one of the issues that requires further attention, both for responsibility, but also for the own definition of armed groups. For the question of uh, Ezekiel, um, whether um, providing reparation, uh, providing apologies by individuals, uh, by um, not the leadership, but civilian branch or other other members, right? Yeah. <laughs> and well, um, I think most of the examples I found, uh, it was the leadership of the group or the unsung uh, local commanders. And um, I would say it would be possible um, that another member or civilian member um, express this apology if it has the, uh, I would say, the acceptance of the leadership to provide these apologies, whether this would reflect an individual position or the position of the group. I'm not quite sure about that. Um, so maybe it's more clear when you find the leadership or some commanders doing this because they really had the representation, let's say, of the group. But indeed, it's actually a very good question that I haven't really thought about that, so. Okay, 
Thank you very, very much, Laura. I think that brings us uh, to the end of the event. I think it was a very, very interesting discussion. Um, I think there should be a follow-up on that. And I think there would be a follow-up on that um, with the assistance of uh, Catherine's blog. And um, I would like to thank all, all the speakers, to Ezekiel, to Catherine, and Manu. And of course, to thank you, Laura, for uh, jumping with us to the water of trying this virtual book launch, uh, which will be one out of many, many to follow. And on that note, I actually want to uh, set up the, the ground for the next session that will be on October 28th. And we will be hosting the book uh, of Natya Kandalashvili Mueller on occupation and control in international humanitarian law. And just for the sake for the edited value, uh, the edited version of, of this video will actually even do this and the book will appear right here later on, um, as we will be seen. And I wanna thank you again, Laura. I wanna thank everyone who came to and participated. We see you have very, very uh, lively participant uh, in the audience from very uh, diverse locations. And then we are familiar with a lot of the names and we invite you to visit Alma's uh, Facebook page or Twitter account, which are uh, very active and to subscribe to our mailing list in order to get invitations for our following event, for future events and other updates on what Alma is doing and uh, IHL development. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone. And that's it. Thank you very much.